worship this morning and I uh, bid you all welcome. Uh, any of you here visiting, you're also welcome with us. Let me give you the announcements for the week ahead. Uh, tomorrow, uh, there's the Synod Day of Prayer, and that's from 10.30 a.m. through to 3 p.m. So that's open to anyone in the denomination to come along, and it's being held at Cully Bagay. So that's 10.30 to 3 p.m. You're asked to bring your own lunch. Tea and coffee will be provided, or if... Uh, folks want the fast, then that's fine. God willing, on Wednesday night, we have our midweek meeting, and that's at 8 p.m., and God willing, I'll be taking that. Um, and next Lord's Day, the services, morning and evening, will be taken by the Reverend Malcolm Ball. So that's next Lord's Day. There is, of course, evening service here tonight, as usual, at 7 p.m., and God willing, I'll be preaching uh, once again. <clears throat> As far as I'm aware, those are all of the announcements that we have for today. Turn with me, please, to the book of Psalms. We sing together from the 42nd Psalm, Psalm 42. We're going to sing the first five stanzas of this psalm. And the tune to which we sing is number 126, Psalm 42, singing stanzas 1 to 5. Like as the heart for water brooks and thirst doth pant and bray, so pants my longing soul, O God, that come to thee I may. Here's the heartfelt cry of a child of God, desiring to be in the presence of God in order to worship God. My soul for God, the living God, doth thirst. When shall I near unto thy countenance approach and in God's sight appear? Probably written at the time of Absalom's rebellion, or possibly at the time when David had to flee from Saul, uh, but certainly a time when David was not able, because of his circumstances, to meet with God's people. We have the privilege and honour of being able to meet with God and with God's people today, and it should be our desire to do so. We sing one to five, we remain seated as we sing, and then I would ask you to stand as we seek the Lord in prayer. Let us worship God together. Heart for water brooks in thirst of and so pants my longing so. Turn, I can't turn. 
thy need. Now let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, as we come into your presence in prayer this morning, we give thanks that we know something, Lord, of what the psalmist was expressing in this psalm when he said, My soul for God, the living God, doth thirst. Father, thank you that you have given us a desire for you. We confess, Lord God, that apart from grace, we have no desire for you. We want nothing to do with you. We are alienated from you, rebels against you. But Lord, thank you that though that is what we were by nature, it is no longer what we are by grace. We thank you for that wonderful regenerating work of the Spirit of God, that work that infused into us spiritual life, that work that opened our eyes so that we could see see ourselves for what we were, see you for who you are in your holiness and your righteousness and your justice, that opened our eyes to behold the Son of God incarnate as revealed to us in the scriptures, that opened our ears to hear the glorious message of the gospel of Christ, and that opened our minds to understand it and our hearts to receive him. Father, thank you for so great salvation, for the gift of faith whereby we laid hold of Christ and in doing so embraced all the great blessings of redemption that Christ himself has purchased. Father, for these great things we lift up our hearts to you in praise today. Thank you for this day. We rejoice, Lord, that we are part of a great company of people all over the world who even in this very hour, are lifting up their hearts in praise to you, our God, our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you too that you've given us your word, not only to draw us to the Saviour, but in order to also make us like the Saviour. And we pray that through the work of the Spirit of God, working through the word, that you would indeed increasingly conform us to his likeness. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We pray that you would cleanse us afresh. We confess to you, Lord God, our many, many failings. Many of those, Lord God, are hidden from others. The sins that are within us, in our attitudes, and in our desires, in our thoughts, in the lusts. Lord God, forgive us, we pray. And forgive us for the obvious sins of speech, of behaviour, failing to do what we ought to do. Lord, we do not want anything to mar our fellowship with you and indeed with one another, and so we pray for cleansing. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, not merely with our lips, but from our hearts. Take away all distracting thoughts. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for the liberty that we enjoy, whereby we're able to gather in a public building such as this and to worship you, We thank you that there are no constraints upon us. We value our civil and our religious liberty. And on this day, Lord, when all over our nation, the nation remembers the privilege that we have of civil and religious liberty. We do thank you for the fact that there were those over the years who represented our nation and who fought to preserve our civil liberties. We pray, Lord God, that you would bless the loved ones of those who have lost family members and friends, not only in the two great wars, but also in ongoing conflicts throughout the world and even, Lord God, in this province in the past years. Lord, there are many whose hearts will be heavy today. And we pray that you would bind up the brokenhearted and that you would bring comfort to those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Thank you for your sovereign providence that granted to us, Lord God, victory and also the preservation of liberty. We do not take it for granted, 
We realize, Lord God, that what we have now could so easily be taken from us. And we pray this morning that, Lord God, you would not only preserve what we have, but that you would work in a mighty way in this nation in which we live and of which we are a part. For, Lord, we have turned from you. We have not really given you the honor and glory that you deserve. The laws of our land are so far removed from your laws. And it grieves us, Lord, to see a nation that had been so blessed walking now in the ways of wickedness. Lord, we pray, turn us back to yourself. Revive your work in the midst of these years and in wrath, remember your mercy. Father, we ask your blessing upon this congregation of your people. We thank you for the young people associated with it. We pray, Lord God, that being brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and having been taught the gospel, that every single one of them would openly confess Christ as their Lord and Saviour. We pray, Lord, that you would build up this congregation, that, Lord God, you would be pleased to add to them such as should be saved. We pray for the village of Loch Breckland itself. We pray for the surrounding towns. We ask, Lord God, that it would please you to stir up people to consider eternal issues and that this congregation might be at the forefront of those who hold forth the word of life in the midst of this darkness and that they might have the joy of seeing sinners coming to Christ for salvation. We ask your blessing, Lord, upon the elders and the deacons. We thank you for them. We pray, Lord, that you would help them to continue to be men of uprightness, of moral and spiritual integrity. And Lord God, that you would use them to take this congregation forward. We pray for the minister-elect. We ask, Lord God, that you would bless Joy and Monica as they make preparations to eventually move here. We pray that all the practical aspects of that would very soon fall into place. And Lord, that soon the day would be upon us when your people here have the joy of once again having an under-shepherd. So Lord, hear our prayers. Bless us in this day of worship and grant that each one of us, keeping the Sabbath day holy, might know the Sabbath day's blessing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So turn with me please to the Word of God. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. We're going to read the whole of this chapter. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and beginning at verse number 1. <clears throat> Let's hear God's word. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest 
unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new and all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is the word of the Lord, and we give thanks to him for this passage of scripture we turn again to our psalm books this time to the 25th psalm psalm 25 and we're going to sing verses 4 through 10 4 through 10 the tune that we use is number 162 Show me your ways, O Lord, thy paths, O teach thou me, and do thou lead me in thy truth, therein my teacher be. Psalm, in this section, it speaks to us of seeking God's clarity and guidance and teaching uh, for us in order that we, having learned that, might walk in God's ways. The last stanza that we sing, the whole paths of the Lord are truth and mercy sure to those that do his covenant keep and testimonies pure. Four to ten, we remain seated as we sing. The tune is 162, and after this we will stand once again as we come to God in prayer. Let us worship God together.
stand. <clears throat> our Father and our God, Lord, it is our prayer that you would show us your ways and teach us your truth so that we would walk in it. We know, Lord, that Satan, like the birds of the air, he's above us, Lord God, and wants to come down, as it were, and take away the seed that is sown. We pray that that seed would not fall onto the wayside. It would not fall into shallow ground or into thorny ground. But Lord God, that our hearts would be suitably prepared for the preaching of your word today, that it would be good soil. And that as the seed is sown, that it would lodge there, that it would germinate, and that it would bring forth fruit in our lives. Help us, Lord, not to be distracted. Give us the ability to focus and all to the glory of your great name. We pray through Christ our Lord and Saviour. Amen. In, I turn this on. It's actually been a while since I uh, preached as such, apart from Wednesday nights, um, here in Loch Brickland, and I'm sure that none of you remember what I preached on the last time, but uh, we're looking at portraits of Christians that was the theme that I said I was going to take up and sort of do a mini-series on. And uh, having looked at a number of descriptions of Christians in the Bible, the last time I preached, I preached on the Christian as an ambassador. Uh, and I pointed out that it was the first of two. Well, this morning's the second of two. Uh, the last time we thought about the ambassador's ministry. And in doing that, we looked at two things specifically the position that the ambassador holds, noting that it was a position of authority, a position of honour, and also a position of representation. And being a position of representation, where the ambassador represents his monarch or his government and his government's interests, the ambassador is expected to be completely and totally loyal to the one who sent him. Uh, also, he is to give priority to the business of the one who sent him, and he's to communicate regularly with his monarch. And then having looked at his position, uh, we also went on then to look at the place that he serves. And I pointed out that uh, wherever uh, an ambassador is sent by his monarch, that is where he is to serve. And wherever he goes, he's to remember his true identity, that he is not a citizen of the country in which he now resides, to which he has been sent, but he is a citizen of the country to which he belongs. And I sought in that last sermon to make practical application of all those different points to our lives as Christians in the 21st century in which we live. So this morning, I want us to continue to look at this picture that Paul draws for us as a Christian being an ambassador, an ambassador of Christ. And having concentrated upon the ambassador's ministry the last time, today I want us to think about the ambassador's message, the ambassador's method, and the ambassador's motives. So that's where we're going today with our study in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at the end of that chapter. First of all, the ambassador's message. And there are two things that I want us to consider in relation to this. First of all, the source of his message. We've already seen that an ambassador is a representative of his monarch, of his sovereign. And as such, he speaks on behalf of him, or her, or their government. And he's to speak on a whole range of issues. And the ambassador's responsibility is not to speak his own mind, nor to express his own ideas. The ambassador's job is to convey what his country, his sovereign, his government, 
want him to say. He gets his brief from those who sent him and on whose behalf he speaks. So whatever the subject that he may be speaking about, he is to make sure that he is up to speed, up to date with the government's current policy on that issue and he's to go along and say, this is what my country says. This is what my king, my queen, my government say on this issue. In the same way, as Christians, we are ambassadors of Christ. And we get what we have to say from him. The source of our message is Christ. We're not free to speak our own mind and to express our own ideas on any given subject. We're to say, this is what our sovereign says. This is what Christ has to say about this. And how do we know what our Lord's mind and will is on any given issue? Well, of course, we go to the handbook. And the handbook is the Bible. And there we find what our Savior has to say. As ambassadors, we're to ensure that we are familiar with what the Bible teaches on issues concerning which we may have to speak. Issues that are likely to come up when we talk to people, whether it's in our families, whether it's in our schools, our universities, the places where we work, or wherever we go socializing, or wherever. We're to know what the Bible has to say about keeping the Lord's Day holy, about consumption of alcohol, about gambling, about marriage, about sex, about the sanctity of life, about the role of women in the church, about the environment. On these and on many other issues, our brief is not to say, well, personally speaking, I think we're to say this is what our Lord says. This is what my sovereign says. The source of our message is God himself, and we find what he has to say to us in the word of God. Second thing we need to consider under this heading is the substance of his message. Not just the source of his message, but the substance of it. Now, I've mentioned some of the subjects upon which we as representatives, as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, are to speak and speak clearly. But important as these matters are, the main subject that we are to speak to people about and to let them know what God has to say with regards to this subject is the subject of their personal position and relationship with respect to God. Specifically that they are actually alienated from God, enemies of God, and need to be reconciled to God Look at what Paul says in verses 18 and following. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing trespasses, their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. As ambassadors, we are to speak on subjects such as abortion, when it comes up, or on euthanasia, sexual morality, drunkenness, Gambling, all sorts of issues. But the primary message that we are to communicate to people around us is the message of reconciliation. Their need for reconciliation with God. In the ancient world, when one country declared war 
on another country, either before the actual conflict began or at some stage during the conflict, perhaps when one army was clearly getting the better of the other army, the king of that country, whose army was most likely to win the battle, would send an envoy, an ambassador, to the king of the other country, offering that king terms of peace. The envoy would set out what the terms of peace were in the treaty and would urge the king who was under the cosh and his generals to accept the terms of peace in order to avoid further bloodshed. They would point out the utter futility of continuing the battle, the outcome of which was certain. So the ambassador came offering terms of peace and reconciliation. And as Christ's ambassadors, Christ's envoys, you and I are sent on a peace mission to the people around us. We're sent to offer terms of peace between a holy God and sinful people. We're to tell men and women and boys and girls that their sin has alienated them from God, that they are his enemies, that they are under God's condemnation and wrath, and that if they don't do something, they're going to suffer the wrath of God eternally. But that's not all we're to say. We're to tell them the good news that God wants there to be peace between sinners and himself. And not only that, that he has made such peace possible. That he's made it possible for them to be reconciled to him. And that this way of peace is found in Jesus Christ, God's own son. But to tell him the message that Paul speaks about here. God has taken the initiative To bring sinners back into a right relationship with himself. That he was in Christ, working in and through Christ to reconcile the world to himself. How did he do that? By making Jesus Christ sin for us. Verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. We're to explain to them how Jesus willingly took to himself the guilt that we incurred because of our sin. Not only did he take to himself the guilt of our sin, but he also bore the punishment that was due to our sin. That he took the place of sinners as he stood under the wrath of God while he hung on the cross at Calvary so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But the Son of God himself made it possible for us to be completely righteous. That our sinfulness and unrighteousness could be covered up with his righteousness. And of course we're to tell them how this reconciliation that has been made possible becomes theirs. It is enjoyed through faith. In Jesus Christ. That's the substance of our message. We are to proclaim Christ. Our king sends us forth. And he says. This is what you are to tell people. You are ambassadors. My ambassadors. And in that work. You are to speak of Christ. When you go to school. When you go to university. You're to speak to those with whom you associate about Jesus. When you go to work, you're to talk to people about the Lord. You're to do your work, of course. You're not to talk so much that you don't do your work and are a bad employee. But you're to communicate the message of the gospel. That place where you live. The people who live around you. God wants us as his representatives in that street, in that community, 
to tell people about the message of reconciliation and to urge them to be reconciled to God. Now here's the question. As an ambassador, are you communicating that message to the people that you associate with? Those people are at war with God and they're on the losing side. And God is offering peace terms. Do they know that they're God's enemies? Do they know they're heading for destruction? Do they know that God holds out the offer of peace? Do they know the terms of peace? The ambassador's message. Its source comes from God. Its substance, wide-ranging, but essentially, be reconciled to God. That brings us secondly to the ambassador's method. The ambassador's method. There's three things I want to note here. We'll deal with each of them briefly. First of all, in communicating his message, the ambassador must do so with clarity. With clarity. And what I mean by that is that the ambassador must be able to communicate the message of his government, his sovereign, in a way that those to whom he is speaking understand what he's saying. Now, in political terms, when a person is appointed as an ambassador, that person, himself or herself, is usually either someone who has already the ability to speak the language of the country to which they're being sent, or they are well known to be capable of quickly learning another language. So, for example, if the government of Britain decide to appoint a new ambassador to France, the ability to speak French is a tremendous asset for any possible candidate. He must be able to communicate in the language of the people to the country where he's going to work. If he can't, the government will provide him with an aide who is able to speak the language until such times as he or she can do so themselves. And as ambassadors, we are to communicate the message of the gospel in a language that the people around us, with whom we mix, will understand. We're not to fall into the trap of using Bible speak, which is the native language of the Christian when it comes to talking about the things of God. We know what it means when we talk about or when we hear someone else talking about being born again. We know what the words salvation, repentance, faith, justification, adoption, and so on mean. But brethren, were we to use that sort of speak, that sort of language when speaking to unbelievers to whom we have been sent, many of them won't have a clue what we're talking about. It's not the language they speak. It would be literally like speaking in a foreign language to them. There's no point going up to someone in your work or your class or your lecture group and saying, have you ever thought about the importance of definitive and progressive sanctification? They wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. Or maybe you're in your canteen and you're sitting beside a colleague and you say, Billy or, or Margaret, I really feel I should talk to you about the need of regeneration by the Spirit of God and the once-for-all justification which results from that on account of the imputed righteousness of Christ which comes through faith, which is God's irresistible grace that he gives to his elect to whom the merits of Christ's victor vicarious substitutionary atonement are conveyed. Now, I dare say that if I was to say that slowly, you would all understand every single word of it. But if you're sitting in a canteen speaking to Margaret, she'll not have a clue what you're talking about. We have to speak the language of the people to whom we are sent to communicate. We need to speak with clarity. Clarity. Secondly, we need to speak with diplomacy. An ambassador 
whilst it's his duty to put across the government's position and speak the mind of his government, he'll not do it in a brusque, rough, abrupt, inconsiderate way. He'll not say, this is our position, take it or leave it. He'll put it across in the most reasonable, sensible, consistent, considerate way that he can. He'll use wisdom to gaze the best method of approach. Remember when Jesus sent out his disciples with the gospel in Matthew 10, 16? He spoke about sending them out like sheep among wolves and told them, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. That expression, as shrewd as snakes and as innocent and harmless as doves, means use your wisdom and tact. Don't deliberately or needlessly cause offence. I have to say, the way some people proclaim the gospel, you would think that they've just completed a 12-week practical course in the art of how do you know and offend people. They stand and they shout at people, and nearly glory in the fact that people are going to hell. They can come across as being very offensive. Yes, we're to preach the gospel, but we're to do it in a way that is clear and we're to be diplomatic. But not only should the gospel ambassador speak with clarity and diplomacy, he or she should also speak earnestly. Earnestly. You see that in verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. The translation there, we pray you, is not as strong as it should be. The word for pray there is not the normal word for prayer. It means more, we implore you. We plead with you. The message is spoken in such a way that it's obvious that the person speaking has a genuine interest in and concern for the well-being of the person to whom he or she is speaking. And that concern comes out where Paul says, we implore you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. It's almost as if Paul's down on his knees pleading with people. This is serious. This is something you must consider. There's an earnestness about him. He doesn't say, here's the message, take it or leave it. And friends, we need to speak on Christ's behalf. And when we do it, we must not only accurately convey the substance of the message of the gospel, we must demonstrate something of the deep concern that Christ had for sinners. We're to speak with passion, with earnestness. We're not simply to invite men and women and boys and girls to be reconciled to God. We're to implore them. There's nothing inconsistent with that, with our reformed position. Have you ever pleaded with someone to be saved? Of course, you'll only convey the message earnestly and with passion and with fervency if you are genuinely concerned for the eternal well-being of the person to whom we're speaking. The earnestness with which we communicate the gospel reflect to a certain degree, and maybe to a considerable degree, how real hell and the awful sufferings of the lost are to us. How real that is. 
If you saw a loved one about to walk out into the road in front of an oncoming lorry that they hadn't seen and knew that if the lorry was to hit them, they would undoubtedly be killed, you would shout at the top of your voice, you'd wave your arms, you'd scream to attract their attention, to warn them of the danger, because you wouldn't want them to suffer that. Something in you would rise up because of the danger they're exposed to. You wouldn't speak in monosyllabic tones and steady voice as though you're talking about the price of a tin of carrots. If we really believe that our loved ones, our friends, people we know are heading for eternal damnation and interminable suffering in hell, would we not be more earnest in our efforts and more passionate in our language as we try to warn them of the danger they face and the unthinkable destiny to which they are heading? An ambassador of Christ. It is important that we convey the message that our King has given us to communicate, but it's equally important how we communicate the message. We're to convey it with clarity, diplomacy, and fervency. The ambassador's message, the ambassador's method, and finally the ambassador's motives. And if you look at the wider context of this passage in 2 Corinthians 5, you'll see a number of motives. First of all, in verse 14, the ambassador is motivated by love. Love for Christ. The love of Christ constraineth us. Another translation is, it compels us. Christ's love for Paul, and arising out of that, Paul's love for Christ. That was what motivated this man in his service. That was Paul's driving force. He thought about what Christ in love had done for him in rescuing him from the wrath of God. He thought about the love of Christ which was shown in all its fullness at Calvary. And that thought produced in Paul a love for Jesus. And that love compelled him to serve his master. And should not be the great motivating factor in our service of Christ. The love of Christ constrains us. The way that's put there in the original, it can either be Christ's love for us or our love for Christ. And as Dr. Blair used to tell us when he was doing our Hebrew classes, although this was in Greek right enough, but Dr. Blair used to say, it's probably both. And I think it is. I think it's Christ's love for us compels us, but that love produces in us a reciprocal love for him. And that compels us. I'm going to throw something out here to you. Could it be that one of the reasons why Christians don't talk enough about Jesus and about the gospel? Could it be that the reason that Christians aren't being ambassadors for Jesus is because they don't really love him? They're thankful to him that he's saved them. They're going through the routine of their church. They believe all the doctrines, but do they love the Savior? Do they love Jesus more than anything else in this world? We were thinking about this at our men's Bible study on Thursday evening. The subject was commitment to Christ. And I was saying to the men, 
that commitment to Christ grows out of love for Christ. Love for Christ. How much do we love him? Do we love him more than anyone in this world? Think about that, man. Do you love Jesus more than your wife? Your kids? Women? Do you love Jesus more than your husband? I told the man on Friday night I was quite annoyed whenever my wife told me that she loved Jesus more than me. I thought she loved me more than anybody. I got a reality check. And it was a while before I realized that I had to love Jesus more than I love my wife. Love for Christ compels us. Secondly, accountability. Accountability. You see that in verse 10. Paul says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's not talking here about being condemned and being saved. He's talking about accountability to God, rewards, and so on. That everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Ambassadors are appointed to serve their country, but they're also accountable for how well they serve because one day they're going to have to come back and to give a report of their work. Somebody's going to examine them to see whether or not they have been faithful in the task they were given. And Paul knew that one day he would have to stand before God and give an account of how he had served his Lord. And that motivated Paul in the here and now in his service of the Lord. He didn't want to stand before his sovereign and be ashamed. He didn't want to stand before the Lord not having fulfilled the responsibilities that God had given him. He wanted to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I sought to represent you. I took my responsibilities as an ambassador seriously and I served as best as I could. And one day we as Christians are going to have to give an account before God of how we have served him in this life. We have to remember that. Yes, we are saved by grace, free grace, and what we do doesn't determine whether we're going to heaven or hell. But how we live will determine how much we're really committed to the Lord. Have we represented him in our family circles? in our schools, our jobs, our social circles? Do those people with whom we mix know we are Christ's ambassadors? And then there's a third and final motivation, and that is to please Jesus Christ. So we make it our goal, says Paul, to please him, to please him. Paul wanted to please his Savior. And he knew that one way of doing that was by being a faithful ambassador for him. All of us like to please people. Well, most of us do. I want to please my wife. I know the sort of things that I should do to please her. There are certain things that she likes me to do about the house, and if I do them, she's well pleased. Uh, children if you want to please your parents you know the sort of things that your mum and dad want you to do and they'll be happy with you they'll say oh I'm really pleased with so and so he tidied his bedroom up or whatever it happens to be we make it our goal to please him I wonder if that's one of the goals that you have as you get up out of your bed each morning I'm going to live this day in such a way as to please my Savior. Not to earn brownie points towards your salvation. Not to do with that. To do with how we live to please Jesus. If you want to please the Lord, as every Christian should, 
then be his ambassador. And be the best ambassador you can be. Be Christ's man, Christ's woman, Christ's young person, wherever you are. And don't be in any way ashamed to tell other people the message that he has given to you. May God bless the teaching of his word to each one of us this morning. God willing, this evening, we'll be thinking about the Christian as a steward. As a steward. Let's turn to our closing psalm of praise. It is psalm number 40. The stanzas that we sing are stanzas 8 through 11. Stanzas 8 through 11 of Psalm 40. The tune to which we sing is number 35. To do thy will I take delight. O thou my God that art, yea, thy most holy law of thine I have within my heart. But it didn't stay in his heart. Within the congregation great I righteousness did preach. Lo, thou dost know, O Lord, that I refrain not my speech. I never did within my heart conceal thy righteousness. I thy salvation have declared and shown thy faithfulness. 8 to 11, let us worship God. Thank
stand. And now receive the blessing of God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Rest and abide upon you, the people of God, this day and forevermore. Amen.